Good afternoon. I'm Amanda Benton, Assistant Director of Alumni Relations at Marist and a graduate from the class of 2011. We're very excited to present this webinar to you today in conjunction with the Hudson River Valley Institute, featuring Spencer Hogan and Emma Dion from the class of 2020 and Alex Prisginsis from the class of 2022. If you do encounter any audio issues, you do have the option to dial in by telephone, and I'm going to put that number and code in the chat box right now for everyone. Um, some other technical notes. Due to the number of participants, we have muted all lines except for the host. Please reserve the chat option for any technical questions or if you have general questions for the Marist staff who are listening. Please do not send private messages to Chris or to the student presenters and use the Q&A feature for questions that you have and be sure to direct your questions to me or I think it just says the host. There are several ways you can view this presentation on your screen. If you hover over the top right corner of the video portion with your mouse, a small icon should appear. A preferred choice for a webinar like this is side-by-side -side view, and as I'm sure you've noticed by now, the presenters are using slides. There will be a brief survey on your screen at the conclusion of the webinar with six questions. It will just pop up automatically, and if you have a minute, it would be extremely helpful for us to have your feedback. I'd now like to introduce our host for today, Chris Proslopsky, who will provide a brief intro to the Hudson River Valley Institute, as well as to today's presenters. Chris received his Master's of Public Administration from Marist in 2011, and he is the Program Director at HRVI and editor of the Hudson River Valley Review. Chris, thanks for spending time with us this afternoon, and I'm handing it over to you. Okay, thank you, Amanda. Uh, I want to begin by thanking Marist College alumni for hosting us today. Uh, I want to thank my colleague Andy Bellani for his vision and organization of this event, and our Executive Director, and the Dr. Frank T. Bumpus Chair in Hudson River Valley History, Dr. James M. Johnson for his support. We also have two of our advisory board members in attendance today. I wanna to welcome Peter Beanstock and Alan Miller. Thanks for being here. So I'm one of the editors of the Hudson River Valley Review and the program director of the Hudson River Valley Institute. But what does that mean? That means we get to spend our days studying a region that we love and sharing what we learn with others. We do this with our internships, our lecture series, our website, HudsonRiverValley.org, and with our biannual peer-reviewed journal. One of my favorite aspects about working at HRVI is that the job renews itself every six months. We have a new lecture or conference to plan, we have a new batch of interns, and we have a new issue of the review to get to press. Articles in the journal are written by regional specialists, including scholars, museum professionals, historic site and other educators. And we publish historians, professors, and graduate students, as well as undergraduates from Marist who often write our regional history forums. These interns spend the semester researching, writing, revising, and working with HRVI staff. They visit the site or resource that they spotlight in their article, and they interview the experts that work there. We try to offer a combination of grad school experience and workplace experience working as a team to develop the best article possible. Interns are the reason that we exist at Marist College. They often provide our greatest inspiration and reassurance that this work matters. Today, you'll hear from three of our most recent and inspiring student authors. They're presenting today in order of their publication, and I'm going to introduce all three right now. We first met, we first met Spencer Hogan when he was taking a class with our executive director, Dr. James Johnson. Spencer came to the office after class one day to share a history epiphany that he had experienced the previous summer. That moment and his internship with us led to the article that he will discuss today. Spencer is a 2020 graduate of Marist College. He majored in economics and business administration with a finance concentration. On campus, he served as executive vice president and academic affairs vice president of the Student Government Association, and he was president of the business club. In 2019, Spencer served as a White House intern in the Office of American Innovation and also served as the Beanstalk family intern with us at HRVI. He is a recipient of a 2020 Alumni Leadership Award and will start his management consult will start as a management consultant with Accenture Federal Services in Washington DC this September. 
Our second presenter, Alex Prisgintis, has actually not interned with us yet. He will soon. I first met Alex a few years ago as a high school senior after he delivered a TED Talk style presentation on the dairy industry in Orange County. When I met him, he stood before a room full of public historians surrounded by crates of historic milk bottles, some of which I believe he may have behind him today. And he was talking into one of the headphone mics, narrating a slideshow full of historic images. He told me then that he was finishing his book on the history of the Orange County dairy industry. So while we can't take credit for his good work, we are very excited to help get some of it into print. Alex is today a junior at Marist, majoring in history with minor in Hudson River Valley Studies. He serves as a trustee of the Woodbury New York Historical Society and is the president of the Hudson Valley Bottle Club. Alex has given more than 30 presentations and provided historic displays throughout the region on railroad history, milk bottles, and the Sullivan County Board Belt Hotels. His forthcoming book is titled Spoiled Milk, Two Centuries of Triumph and Corruption in Orange County, New York's Lost Dairy Farming Empire. Rounding out our list of exceptional students, we have Emma Dion, who first introduced herself by email from London while interning there with a member of parliament. She sent her resume and asked how to apply for an internship. We quickly replied to inform her that she had just done so and she had been accepted. Emma is a 2020 graduate of Marist College. She majored in history with a minor in political science. Emma was presented at the Student World Affairs Conference, interned with Parliament as a Hansard Scholar, and published an article, The Danger of Hysteria, the Public Dimension of Japanese American Internment, 1935 to 1945 in the Gateway History Journal. Emma received Marist's 2020 Award for Excellence in History and is a recipient of the prestigious James Madison Fellowship. She will pursue graduate work in history at Brandeis University this fall prior to becoming a secondary education teacher. Emma began, this, Emma began the semester for the Hudson River Valley Institute as a part of our team working on an oral history of rowing on the Hudson. That project spans the original Poughkeepsie Regatta through today's community rowing associations. She researched the history and culture of the sport, wrote questions for our subjects, and conducted the interviews. When COVID-19 placed that project on hold, she switched to writing about the Poughkeepsie Regatta collection in the Marist College archives. So thanks again for joining us today, and let's hear about some history. Thank you, Chris and Amanda and everyone else who helped us put this together. So I want to start, dive right in with a look at the map on your screens. In green, you see Orange County, New York's Highland Lakes State Park, which uh, part of its southern border is formed by Route 211, a main commercial route in the central part of Orange County. The park is located just minutes from Middletown, New York, where I'm actually speaking to you from right now. The park is, to most passers-by, an untouched, uninhabited plot of wooded land with some great trails and, as you'll notice, once inside, a surprising amount of ruins. At first glance, uh, quite the story can be conjured up in the mind of someone exploring those trails for the first time. But on closer investigation, concrete foundations, a swimming pool with some lingering blue paint, these are no ruins of 18th century settlers. I refer to the inhabitants of the land in the Hudson River Valley as a for people and groups, including a short-lived nudist colony that got a lot of national attention in 1932, uh, the chateau of a wealthy French dancer among 15 or so families who spent their lives on the land enjoying the peace and quiet, and a storied YMCA summer camp. Now, I know that's a lot to cover, so I'm just going to walk you through some highlights. Um, I began my work with the Hudson River Valley Institute, as Chris actually said, in 2017 after taking Colonel Jim Johnson's Hudson River Valley History course during my second semester at Marist. Uh, a curiosity stemming from some archives on a YMCA camp that I discovered while working at the YMCA of Middletown ballooned into nearly two years of investigation on what lies beneath the leaves and overgrowth in this sleepy state park. So let's set the scene with some images from 1967, just before the park. Now, between 1964 and 1970, the Palisades Interstate Park Commission uh, 
bought land from around 15 families to help create the wooded park that stands there today. Among them, uh, Ruth Swika, who I had the amazing privilege to speak to about the land and about her experience living there, growing up there, and use a paper she wrote about this situation, her land being taken from her family and her neighbors, uh, for a course that she took at Orange County Community College in the mid-1960s. She called that neighborhood where she grew up and started to raise her own family the most quiet corner of Orange County and was surprised as her family and their neighbors were contacted by state appraisers about the park, which would take the place of their homes. Interestingly enough, and you would never know this until you dug deep in, and I was shocked to learn that some of the property's lakes were actually man-made by And that particular component of the story I would have had no idea with about if I hadn't dug way deep into this whole puzzle. Um, one of Ruth Swika's family's neighbors, John Halloran, wrote an amazing op-ed uh, for the Middletown Times-Herald record in 1964 on behalf of his small wooded community, expressing their concerns. He relates the fact that the state had previously condemned and took over his mother's house for progress and later seized a commercial property that he owned for progress. So addressing the appraisal of his wooded Orange County property, he pleaded in this op-ed, if, if this final piece of property of mine is seized by you, will you please find someone who can tell me a safe place for me to live? Now, the photographs you see are from three years later, and unfortunately, it coincides with a newspaper report on the dismantling of homes to make way for the park. Um, other homes that weren't dismantled, I should note, were moved off their foundations in full to new plots of land just outside the park and still stand today. This was all done to clear way for a $500,000 state park. The money had already been allocated, the plans were in place, and they were ready to go. Now, the other half of this story comes not from the property owners who lost their land, but from kids who were having the time of their lives at a summer camp just down the road. I had the chance to speak with many of the pictured gentlemen to help put together the story of Camp Orange, and some of them are actually listening to this presentation here today. So welcome and thanks for being here. A YMCA camp had existed on the site since the mid-1930s, and though the exact start year is unknown, at least to me, um, there were 112 boys in attendance by the summer of 1935. This photo, as you can see, is 30 years after that. The pool, built in the mid-1960s, you can see up on the screen now, uh, took over after the freshwater lakes had long served as a swimming outlet for campers. The pool has now grown over with vegetation, but the tiles marking the line between the shallow and deep end and some light blue paint are still visible under the moss and some saplings growing. Now, hikers beware, the pool is hidden beneath brush and overgrowth and one could stumble into this concrete pit in the middle of the woods if they're not careful. The pool only got around a decade of use, which I'll elaborate on in a moment. Now, let's take a look at this map. Uh, it was created last year with the help of Terry Murray, a Camp Orange alumnus, and you can see how much existed on this particular plot of land when the camp was in its prime, right at the end in the mid-1960s. Notice the dining hall rectangle. Uh, Toward the bottom of that map, the long dark gray rectangle, where it appears, well, this is it today. The remains just over 55 years later. The wooden components of the structure were lost to a fire in 1973, but the beautiful stonework remains, just rising up on the top of the hill in the middle of an unassuming state park. The YMCA was allowed to continue operation of the camp. Uh, after the land came under the jurisdiction of the Park Commission in 1970, but the land ended up going to full park as the camp sadly shuttered in 1973 when this mess hall burned in a fire. Now, as to that $500,000 budget for the developed park that was going to take the place of this quiet, wooded neighborhood and the camp, it never came to be, but that's likely for the better. The serenity that people have sought on this land for so long 
continues, only now as a public park designed by the state rather than a private retreat that former residents created for themselves. In that op-ed I mentioned, uh, Halloran referred to this as his park. Ruth Swika used the same phrase. So to give Ruth Swika, a former resident uh, who helped immensely with this research, the final word, she told me that she did think that in the end, everyone made out all right. And then said that she's glad it's a state park with really nothing in it, rather than having been developed with tons of new cookie cutter houses back there. As she said, it's still much more like it was in our days. The park's surroundings in nearby Middletown and across the region are less rural than ever before. And as residents continue to relocate to this area, build new homes and demand more services, the park is moving against the grain. That's what's so special about all of this progressing in the opposite, but a more welcome direction. Highland Lake State Park is becoming more wild, less like its commercialized surroundings than ever before. So with the past of this park not yet so far removed, I want you to take this story of the park's history as an opportunity to explore and enjoy it. So long, and this is the most important part, as we continue to protect what was characterized in 1964 as this most quiet corner of Orange County. So with that, I want to pass it over to Alex for the next piece of the presentation. Thank you, Spencer, for a wonderful job. So moving on, I will be taking a more large look at Orange County and analyzing how milk really began as a huge marketing and developed its market largely in this nestled little region of New York State. Now, I'd like to begin at looking at this wonderful picture seen here of the dairymen um, in Orange County, particularly at some unknown cream roof in the area. And with this, I'd like to present a picture, and that is why Orange County? There are many other dairy regions, even across the state, we can look at Wisconsin or even in central New York state that seem to be very favored for this type of agriculture. And why it is Orange County, I tend to give it more of a combination of certain instances that happened. For one, you have the preferred ge uh, geography of the area, also to mention is, of course, the landscape, uh, the transportation innovation that we'll be discussing today, as well as the hard work of the farmers that all came together to make this area an important place in dairy farming history. Now, Spencer gave us a little look at the geography and uh, in the middle town region, and I'll be taking a large look, of course, across Orange County. Now, um, overall here are three regions that we're looking at, but there are seven that I discuss when I do my lectures on milk bottles from the area. To start, regions one and three located to your furthest left and right, those are what I refer to as the southeastern and western regions. These are areas that tend to have mountainous terrain uh, caused by the Hudson Highlands and the Schwangunk Mountains. And although they weren't necessarily favorable for farming, there were still many dairy farms in those areas. Region six and seven towards the top being the northeastern northern region where the cities of Newburgh and the towns of Montgomery and Walden are located also had more hilly terrain, but they had a little more uh, populations of farms since they had more favorable agriculture. The regions though, however, that were most important were two, four, and five. Those are the central east, central west, and southern regions respectively. These are areas with the cities of Middletown and towns such as Goshen, Warwick, and of course, the one we'll be discussing today, Chester. This is the location of the Black Dirt region near Pine Island and uh, I refer to it often as the heartland of Orange County. What made this region important is that it was about a thousand feet above sea level, which protected it from any of the sea level funguses that could have been located on a coastal plain. And because of this, the soil was especially favorable for especially having cows and agriculture, and as we'll see, very funny. Now, an important thing to represent is that before the 1800s, there was not much heavy industry in the United States abroad, so milk could not exactly be shipped across great distances. So in this time, I refer to butter as the king crop for dairy farming within Orange County. At this time, Goshen was the center of this innovation. And in fact, over four decades after butter uh, really died as a product, uh, companies in far away Elmira, New York, were still referring to the product as Goshen butter. Now, at this time, farmers were shipping this butter to New York City as um, opening a market, and uh, the trip to New York City was quite arduous. These farms are located in towns such as Westtown, Unionville, and Goshen, would have taken their brother 
taken their butter along a uh, arduous journey uh, along dirt roads that were full of tolls to Newburgh, New York, where they would then ship their butter down barges to New York City. This was a very profitable business, and in 1829, the city of Newburgh shipped more than 3,500,000 pounds of butter, which in return gave $560,000 to Orange County. Even after uh, milk became the key crop for dairy farming in Orange County, butter was still popular. In 1856, the first butter factory was opened in Campbell Hall, New York, along Route 207. If you're ever in that area, you can still see the New York State historical marker for the site. And uh, even further along, we had many butter factories across the county. We can see a wonderful picture here with many employees outside the Greenleaf family's butter factory in Otisville in the northern part of the county. While butter did serve a purpose for some years, that all changed with the coming of the railroad in Orange County. In the early 1830s, the New York and Erie Road was, uh, was um, proposed as a line between Piermont, New York, and Dunkirk along Lake Erie, and construction was started shortly after. Now, upon reaching the town of Chester, New York, the construction workers encountered a problem, and that was the black dirt, which was, although so suitable for agriculture, not terrible to build a railroad upon. So to get around this solution, to get around this problem, a solution was created, and that can be seen right here. Uh, as you can see, there were wooden piles that were driven between 50 to 60 feet into the black dirt that created a stable foundation. And once those piles were driven in, dirt would be filled in to make a more suitable landscape, and thus the tracks would have a strong foundation to ride upon. Now, you might ask, what would this railroad construction technique have to do with the development of milk transportation in Orange County? Well, in fact, it's how it all begun. As the person who was employed for uh, delivering this construction, his name was Thaddeus Selleck. Uh, Selleck was an employee of the Erie Railroad, and while he completed his work on time, the railroad became bankrupt after its completion and could not pay Selleck for his work. So in return, he became the first station agent at Chester, New York. Now, while at Chester, Selleck understood and realized the pure quality of Orange County milk. Um, in comparison to what was called a swill milk in New York City, uh, this milk was delivered by cows that were kept in close quarters at brewery stables. The milk tended to have a blue color and tended to also congeal, and of course was deadly and in the 1850s caused many deaths of infants. Selleck wanted to devise a plan that would ship this milk from Chester to New York City, but of course at that time uh, there was no means of transportation that was able. Of course, now we have the railroad. So his only problem was to convince the farmers who were headstrong and steadfast in wanting to deliver the milk across this distance. Over time in 1841, he found one farmer named uh, Philo Gregory of Chester, New York. Uh, Gregory agreed to ship the milk to Chester um, under the condition that it would be sold immediately upon its delivery. And in the spring of 1842, the first successful milk shipment was made from Chester to New York. That was 240 quarts of milk. Uh, ironically, when the milk arrived at Chester, farmers, uh, I should say not farmers, but consumers were appalled by the yellow scum on top that was in fact the rich creamy layer that was not prevalent in the disastrous swill milk of New York City. And as time came on, farmers stopped laughing at Selleck's proposal and instead decided to send and ship more milk to New York City. And by 1897, 750,000 quarts were being shipped per day from the region to New York. Now, going from here, the dairy industry in Orange County practically boomed in what I called the golden age of dairy farming. Uh, in around 1881, it was reported that uh, 4,016 farms alone were located in Orange County. Now, that is not an exact number of dairy farms, but in interviewing local farmers in the area, they estimate the number at that time to be around 2,900. Uh, there was a lot of drama during this time as well. For about the first 30 years, the farmers were able to cooperate well and uh, designate their prices between dealers. However, uh, soon dealers became greedy and farmers often were underpinned and undermined in their prices. And at that time, there were even two milk strikes, one in 1883 and a second in 1916, where farmers actually withheld their milk shipments from New York City. This was the conflict that ensued between the dealers marking the milk and the farmers producing the milk. But in that time, a new innovation came about known as the milk bottle, which we can see many pyroglyst style milk bottles here that allowed farmers to sell their milk independently within the county. 
Of course, this would have been more expense for the farmers since they had to build their own bottling plants and milk processing plants, but you didn't have to deal with the troubles of the dealers. Unfortunately, today, Orange County's dairy farming has entered a swift decline. Um, there were 42 dairy farms left in the region as of 2016, and in 2018, seven more of those closed. So today, I recommend the best thing you can do to remember this rich history is to collect the milk bottles themselves and to go out and support your local dairy farms during this struggling time. An interesting solution I see is having colleges themselves work with dairy farms, and this was exhibited in 2018 when the Catskill Creamery opened a location at the Sullivan County Community College offering by the SUNY system, which now processes milk from Sullivan County dairy farms at the county itself. I think the benefit of this is that it allows uh, students at the community college to understand the history of the dairy farms as well as to invest themselves in the work that is required. So in the future, if you ever see one of these milk bottles or an old dairy barn within Orange County, it's important to think of the rich history that this region has with the innovation of marketing dairy products across the country. Thank you. And with that, I will turn it over to Emma, who will discuss the Poughkeepsie Regatta. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Alex, and thank you, Spencer. So the um, Marist College collect, uh, Archives Collection Spotlight that I wrote for the review is called the Poughkeepsie Regatta at 125. So as Chris said, this semester, I became an intern at HRBI, and they explained the documentary project that we would be working on together. This included doing research into the historic Poughkeepsie Regatta and interviewing subjects from Marist, the Sport of Crew, and also the Hudson Valley in order to create a documentary that highlighted that both the history and the legacy of this regatta. As Chris explained as well, our plans were sadly derailed due to COVID-19 on the documentary portion. However, this led me to shift my efforts into writing this form for the review. A collection spotlight is meant to highlight a historical resource for people who would be interested, which meant that my job was to highlight the Poughkeepsie Regatta collection at the Marist College Archives. Librarians Anne and Elizabeth did a great job thoroughly explaining the regatta in a previous panel, and it was their expertise that helped me understand the significance of the regatta. The Poughkeepsie Regatta, which used to take place on the Hudson River from 1895 to 1949, with a few breaks in the middle um, for war years and the Depression year, um, this race was the Intercollegiate Rowing Association, or the IRA. It's, it was its race of the year for the row for collegiate rowing teams, and the only the best teams would come to Poughkeepsie to compete. The course was on the unpredictable river of the Hudson, and it was a um, straight four-mile course for the varsity rowers to have a race course on. They came, the teams came from as far as California and Washington State, and they often came on trains with their gear loaded up in the back. The teams would stay on either side of the river, um, Poughkeepsie being on one side and Highland being on the other side, and they would stay in boathouses built for them to stay in, which became known as Regatta Row and had its own social scene and social life. One of the houses still stands at Marist College today, the Cornell Boathouse. And this reflects the ways that Marist tries to keep this piece of history alive. The winning team would go on to compete in the Olympics. And the most famous instance of that is the Washington team going on to beat Nazi Germany in the 1936 Berlin Olympics, which is um, made popular through the book The Boys in the Boat, which some of you may be familiar with. And the photo that we're looking at right now is the Poughkeepsie Highland Railroad Bridge, which now you can walk on it as the walkway over the Hudson, and the teams would finish just past the bridge. The regatta was not only important in the world of sports, but it also had the scope of a modern day Super Bowl in terms of the impact that it had on society. People would flock to see the race from all over, including important families like the Roosevelt's and the Rockefellers. It was a social event of the year. This race was so important to Poughkeepsie's economy and its pride that the city actually paid for many of the boathouses to be built. There are many fun aspects of the race that I came across, from the gambling scene to the makeshift boathouses and to the spectator train, where a freight train would actually become moving bleachers for the race day. And the people who bought tickets to this train would get to sit on it with their binoculars and actually follow along the course as the rowers um, went those four miles. The interviews I conducted helped give me a sense of the excitement of the, these races. And one of the people I interviewed had a family connection with the Bellevue Hotel where one of the teams stayed for years. 
again, this really helped me give, give me a sense of the race and what it would have been like to be there. And the photo you're looking at now shows the crew shells going down the middle and then all the private boats where people would be watching. And again, it shows just how big it was. There would be people crowded on all sides, both banks of the river. And then those lucky enough to have boats would watch right there from their boats. So what you're seeing here is actually a photo from the spectator train. Um, you could see a couple of the bleachers and then it was completely packed. Um, Marist College Archives collection actually has a few tickets from this um, spectator train and it was really exciting. And some people had radio to follow along, but especially in the earlier years, this was how you got the best view and you got to see who won first. So my research for this forum began with my initial research for the documentary project. And I did this by reading different histories about Poughkeepsie and Dutchess County. Um, and a few of them touched on or covered the regatta. Next, I spent time in the archive pulling out boxes of articles and ephemera to give myself a feel for the event and to dig deeper into what it actually was. The archives were an amazing resource and the dedication of the archives to preserving history is very clear as the collection uh, for this regatta has grown to over 60 boxes from just two in six years. It helped me realize how huge the scope of the event was by looking through all of these um, documents and images. And the regatta collection is the only publicly accessible collection dedicated to the regatta. Part of my research included a thorough search into other colleges archives um, who participated in the historic races such as Cornell and Syracuse. And I did find some collections on specific rowers or coaches or photographs and memorabilia from the regatta days. However, like I said, this was the only publicly accessible collection that covered the race as a whole, not just a part. And the reason why Marist is able to have such a well-rounded and unbiased collection is because, well, is because Marist was never involved in the race. And while the race took place on the water, right outside of it, the Marist of today did not exist and was not a participant. In this way, Marist has taken on the role of steward of the history and legacy of the race in the form of the collection. My favorite component of the project was the interview process. Along with Chris and Andy, I interviewed people for the documentary project we were working on. And while the interviews are not mentioned in my article, they greatly influenced it, as they gave me a better understanding of crew and the race. While we only got through a couple of people to interview before the COVID crisis began, talking to the rowing team members on, from the community and from Maris, and talking to people whose families had historic experiences and ties to the regatta gave me a better sense of the race and also the sport of um, rowing crew. Be, and for me, the interviews influenced my forum article just as much as my research did. It helped give more insight into the sport of rowing and the spirit of the event. And it also helped with one of the things that I really included in my forum um, article, that is the scope of the event, which I've talked about. And that really came through from this collection because there's so many articles, advertisements, and photographs that showed me that it wasn't a tiny event as I kind of had a preconceived notion of. It was the event of the summer. And this was important to me because crew of today, and at least in my mind, is a more hidden sport, um, and it's not as visual. And back then, people all across America knew about this event and traveled to Poughkeepsie, and that was something that was really amazing to me. So this collection is really diverse and in terms of media, and it really reflects the culture of the race, including the athletic elements, the economic aspects and the spectator experience across the span of 55 really eventful years. There's so much to see from articles to color advertisements and brochures to film and even uniforms from the race. One of the aspects of the collection that I highlighted was the fact that the Marist Archive is dedicated not just to preserving history, but also sharing it. They have organized events in the past with the local school, with, um, with students who read Boys in the Boat, which I mentioned earlier, and they let the, the students come in and engage with artifacts and look at their collection, which really helped with, um, with how they engage with the book. 
and also they created an online finding aid, which will be available in the fall. And the people from the archives really used every possible avenue to find artifacts. They worked with other collections and historians in the area. They used eBay to purchase items and heirlooms from families. And they also made relationships with families who had rowers, um, ancestors or family members who were rowers in the historic races. And some of them even trusted the archive with their family heirlooms, such as the pair of oars hanging in the Cornell Boathouse on Marist campus. Um, I also think that, or I had to think when I was writing this about who would be most interested in looking at this regatta collection. And while I think that anyone should take a look, it turned out that it's especially good resource to writers, people with historical family connections, and anyone interested in the sport of crew or Marist history. So this collection fits in with Marist's other archives collections on environmental, regional, and local history. And I think it, that it shows Marist's dedication to its role in the Hudson Valley and preserving history at large. Coming into this project, I had been on campus for almost four years and had never known the history of the regatta, even though I had seen the pictures hanging up in the quiet dining room and I kind of heard about crew and a race that used to happen, but I also didn't know the history of the boathouse or of the race itself. Now, however, whenever I'm on campus, I see the walkway over the Hudson as the finish line of the race. I see the boathouse as it would have been in this picture, sandwiched between many other boathouses. And I see the train that goes across the river from, cam from Marist campus as it would have been covered with spectators going by to watch the exciting race. And it's most fascinating to me that I've worked in and visited arch many archives but that the work that the Marist Archive is doing to not only preserve their work, but share the work is really special. And I'm happy to have had the chance to promote it and to explore it myself. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Alex. And thank you, Spencer. Uh, I think Amanda will be on with some questions in a moment. I was writing down some notes as we go. Um, and it just occurred to me how each of you really stressed the importance of uh, local of artifacts and uh, local history collections, and that each of you had engaged in interviews and, and oral history. Uh, so maybe we'll get back to that. But uh, and and I have some questions if we do. But first, we'll we'll let Amanda pass some along from our audience. Thank you. Yeah, so just a quick note to the audience, if you do have questions for Spencer, Alex, and Emma, whether that's about their internship, the research and writing process, or more specifics about their individual research project, um, please type those into the Q&A box. Um, we have had a few come in, but one sort of general, general one while we're waiting for other questions. Can you each tell us what originally interested you in your project topic? Um, and Spencer, do you mind going first? Sure. So. I actually um, had been exploring and been on this park property for probably a decade growing up in the summers and such um, before I really connected that there could possibly be some great hidden history. Um, while I was working at the YMCA in Middletown, I came across some of their old historic records really buried at the bottom of a filing cabinet. Um, lost forever until I, I guess, discovered them. Um, those are now on display in the lobby, and it actually mentions uh, at the main building of the YMCA in Middletown on Highland Avenue, this Camp Orange. It was two years after that, taking uh, Colonel Johnson's class, that I started to explore this further and thought maybe we have a publishable story here. So that's where it came from. Great. And how about you, Alex? Well, not surprisingly, I got my start on this topic by collecting milk bottles. I was given my first milk bottle when I was about 11 years old by my mentor who has since passed away, Mr. Herman Galbert. And from there, when I developed a sizable collection, I started lecturing just on the milk bottles themselves. And after going around to a few historical societies, I realized that it was not just the bottles, but also the history behind them that needed to be researched and was important to telling the overall story. And it was from there that I really started the research for my work and what's evolved to now. Great. And Emma? So Andy and Chris at HRVI um, approached me with this topic and the documentary project that they wanted to get working on. 
And what really caught me, my interest about it was the fact that I really had no idea of this history, even though it's something that, again, Marist wasn't involved, but Marist has been very involved for the past six years of preserving the history. And I, as a history student, knew a lot of the local history and had never heard about that. And so I think the fact that Marist has that piece, even the Cornell Boathouse, and students like me had no idea what it was, even though we'd pass it all the time. That really um, drew me in, and I really wanted to figure out, okay, what what is this event, and why should I, why should anyone care, especially at Marist? Great, thanks, Alex. Um, I have a more specific question for you. Um, Someone was interested in the two milk strikes that you mentioned. Um, we we're wondering if the farmers managed to get any of what they were looking for from those strikes. That's an interesting question. Um, in both cases, for about the first, I'd say, two years or so, the farmers were successful in getting what they wanted for the most part. They did get the higher prices they requested per course of milk. But what was the issue is, most part, that the farmers, due to their rural outkeep, were always scattered while the dealers centrally located in New York City were more organized. And as a result, the dealers were always able to get the upper hand after every few years or so. And the problems kept heading back, hence why we had the two major strikes in 1883, which was actually called the Orange County Milk War and the 1916 milk strike. But there were also other strikes, most notably in 1919 and also in 1937, which was a statewide milk strike. So yes, the farmers did get the, what they want in the short term, but in the long term, the dealers always found a way to expose their tricks back on the farmers. Got it, thanks. Um, and Emma, you had mentioned that Marist Archive was kind of the premier collection, um, but are there other large collections about the Poughkeepsie Gut Regatta elsewhere in the country? And if so, are they different from the Marist one and in what way? So in terms of publicly accessible, I could, Marist is the only one that has um, one that can be found online. I was not able to contact the individual archives at the schools. However, it would be interesting to see if there are some that aren't, again, like I said, that aren't um, available on their archival um, college pages. However, like I said, there are different collections that are maybe about a Syracuse coach and they put that together or um, their teams, the times their teams won. However, Maris is the only one to my knowledge and to um, that, that I could search that has a comprehensive one about the whole 55-year um, span and the regatta in general. So Marist has all the team results and it includes every college. So people who went to Syracuse, for example, could look at Marist's um, archive and find plenty about their own teams, um, times that they were in the race. However, like I said, there was not nothing else that was possible to be found online so far. Um, Spencer, were you surprised that there were so many ruins left in the park? And do you think that's a positive or a negative for the park itself? Um, and then also, do you think that's a positive or negative for people like yourself in learning and understanding the past? Yeah. So I'll start by saying that I only brushed the surface of the types of ruins and the stories in the park. I kind of gave you the big two stories of things that were there in the past, but then there's also, you know, a 20 to 25 bedroom mansion and a huge farmhouse property that had all different high profile uses over the years that burned down in 2005 or six. So there's a ton in there and you definitely know walking around on these trails that there's huge amounts of history, but for all, for all we're concerned, it could be 18th century, 19th century, not 1960 or 1970. So I think the bigger surprise is how new the ruins really are, not their existence. Um, and then, of course, it's, it's a great thing for people out there and explore, and generally it's pretty quiet in there, so it stays that way. Um, but the more curious people get with what those ruins are. Perhaps there's other stories that I could never even imagine that could be uncovered by others who are going in there and learning about the past. So I think it presents a pretty special opportunity for Orange County residents to keep exploring. Great. Um, Emma, 
Someone said, uh, you mentioned the collegiate teams, but not every team there was obviously from a college. Did you find information about teams that were either just community teams or, you know, different affiliations? Um, and did their participation or experience vary at all? Or was there anything like unique about these teams that weren't associated with colleges? So every team that did participate was from a college. Okay. Um, in, the, in the IRA regattas. But since then, I have um, talked to community rowers and people who are like in, involved in the sport today as a modern sport, because for the documentary, we were looking at the legacy of crew in the region and how it's um, how that history has imp impacted it. However, the teams that competed during the um, race years in the historic regatta were all from um, colleges and Navy competed one year or a few years, but they were all from colleges such as, um, for example, like Cal California, uh, some California colleges and um, Harvard or Yale came one a few years. But other than that, it was um, the colleges who were the had won in their area against their own regions and came to the IRA. Again, it was the best of the best got to compete, and then they moved on to the Olympics. Yeah. Amanda, I'll, I'll just jump in quickly. Um, in terms of the oral history project we were looking to do with the Institute, we were struck, uh, and Emma had actually really been uh, key in this, in pointing this out, you know, the evolution of an Ivy League sport that had become more of a community-oriented sport. So that is not in uh, the, the spotlight that she has written. It is a big part of the uh, oral history project, which we're very hopeful that we'll be able to get back to sometime this year. So, thanks. So I don't know if the answer is yes for any of you on this question, um, but someone asked if anyone is working on uh, another paper or another research project currently, um, either on the same topic or a different topic, or if there's anything you hope to research or write about in the future. Well, I can think. Who wants to go first? <laughs> In my case, though, you know, at some point I'd love to get back to it. At this point, I'm a little bit more career oriented, having just graduated. But um, I will say for those listening that graduate school is in the picture at some point. So I'll keep you posted. <laughs> like Spencer, I just graduated. Um, and as Chris mentioned earlier, I'm going to continue my master's in American history at Brandeis, and there I will be doing my master's thesis focused on um, actually Asian American history in the 19th and 20th centuries. And um, I also have a constitutional focus as um, I have the James Madison Fellowship. So I definitely like, I'm involved in a lot of different parts of history, but there, there will be some more papers in the future, more on American history. Well, at this time, I'm currently working on two papers, one actually discussing the milk strikes and the struggle between farmers and dealers for Phi Alpha Theta. And I'm also working on a uh, paper for my uh, town's railroad stations for the local Orange County Historical Society Journal. In the future, I hope to publish another article with the HRVI Institute, as well as possibly for the New York State Journal. And of course, I'm always working on my book, which I hope to uh, start going to the publishing stage in the next few months. Wonderful. Um, Spencer, this is back for you. You mentioned speaking to almost all of the individuals in the Camp Orange photo. How did you decide who to interview and which leads to follow? And is there ever a point where you're like, enough information is enough? Oh, there was, I believe it was the summer of, and Chris, correct me if I'm wrong here, summer of 2018, when I spent two months really trying to track down as many people and perspectives as I could find. Um, and I believe it was either seven or eight who ended up giving me really all different stories. And it's funny because they all knew each other. These are, it was a circle of friends who really preserved this history and they all had binders of photos and archives of the camp. Um, and then in terms of the, the Swika family and others, that was just by sheer luck through someone connected to the YMCA that knew I was working on this that, oh, I know someone who 
lived back in there 60 years ago. So it was just by talking about this in my daily life for a solid year that I found people who had the perspectives. And luckily I, I covered as much as I could. Um, I think Chris and Andy can agree that there came a point though when um, some of those who got really excited that I was writing about this just kept feeding me more and more information and it came to a point where, okay, if I have time at some point, I could write a book about all of you, but now is not the time. I'm just going to intervene and, and on Spencer's behalf say, actually, we made him cut it off. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, but yes, there was a feast and famine aspect to the investigating and, and, and putting together the oral histories. Um, and for better and worse, eventually there was a publication deadline. So uh, apologies to, to any of your informants, Spencer, who, whose stories didn't make it in. You can, you can put it on us. <laughs> That's the work of a future HRVI intern somewhere down the line. Yeah. Uh, it's funny that you mentioned that. Um, someone had asked, what advice would you have for other students about the benefits of this type of experience? So I guess that's more for Emma and Spencer, who did have the internship, although Alex, you can weigh in on just, you know, the writing and getting published portion of it as well, of course. Um, Emma, do you want to start? Sure. So I would highly recommend interning with HRVI. I, I wanted an internship where I could get kind of hands-on and do archival research, but in this also at the same time, do something that connected with people more and they were really able to um, let me have that. I was able to do really fascinating research in the archives, but then go out and interview people, meet with people from the community um, and crew and Maris and more have a direct impact um, in my opinion. And again, as a historian, I love working in archives, but I did want that um, public connection and feeling like I was connecting people with history. And HRVI with Chris and Andy are really great at letting me know that what I can do to take the project on and also giving me um, a lot of help. I know I'm sure Spencer would say the same. They're really good at directing my writing. Um, this is my first time writing in a collection spotlight or for a forum and it's just a really good way to keep learning history but outside of the classroom and so I'm really glad that I took that this as an extra instead of a class this past semester and I would recommend it to any history student. It's like the perfect answer. Is there anything you want to add Spencer? <laughs> absolutely echo everything that Emma said but then um, in terms of looking beyond the, the frame of a historian to the other things that I'm going to be doing in the career I'm going into. Um, I've been in, and I've said this before, I've been in some pretty serious internship and job interviews and otherwise where the first question isn't tell me about your time in the White House or tell me about the, you know, expertise you have in X academic area, whatever it may be. The technical stuff. People are curious about the thing that's different. And for me, that's proven in the publication of primary source research. So, what it's done for me and it's what it's done for other students, huge. Um, so, I want to thank the whole HRBI team for that. And I've done it before, but I'll say it again. So, that's my contribution. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm going to have one final question for everyone. Um, what were the biggest challenges and the proudest moments during re the research process of your article? Um, Alex, do you want to start biggest challenge and proudest moment? Um, certainly. I think the biggest challenge was just, uh, finding the sources at first. Um, at the beginning, there was walls that I was using for my work. And from there, I had to uh, heavy research, which I enjoy doing. It's really a struggle for me, but it was heavy research nonetheless and finding newspaper articles and their scholarly work to substitute for that source. That was a lot of fun. And I say my proudest moment was the publication itself for receiving the journal at my primary. It was a lot of fun to uh, read the final. And I want to thank everyone at HRVI that made such a wonderful product. Uh, Spencer, do you want to tackle that? Sure. Um... I think the proudest moment was having all of the 
folks who I mentioned in the article and who I interviewed to get information, letting them read about their own story in, in my words and hearing all of their kind notes afterward. Um, and just as kind of a one added piece, I did see a question or comment in there on whether any of these students went to, these campers went to Marist. And as far as I know, none of them did. Um, so if someone knows otherwise, it would be great info for HRVI. So. Um, uh, go ahead, Emma. <laughs> and then I think the biggest challenge going to mind um, had to do with the interview process for the project itself, as I'd done oral histories before, but I had never been involved with the making of, of a documentary. And to be crafting the questions and then sitting there asking the questions um, and making sure they were done right, um, to me was at first a big learning um, process. And then, like I mentioned, we were only able to get through a handful of people, but that was also my one of the proudest moments because I was really able to get such a good sense of the race and talking to people who love crew or who love the history and are really interested and even people who, um, like I said, with the live in near the historic or on the site of the historic hotel. Um, and these are people, it was really nice hearing the different pieces of the story come together and especially because it's something that happened almost on Marist campus. People would sit along what's now Marist campus and watch this race go by. And again, that I didn't know about it and that now I can share what the archives are doing. And I hope that they, um, from the spotlight, get their praise because the 60 boxes of material are really amazing. And even the fact that it has moving images or that I got to see a wool uniform from Cornell Rower. Um, and these things are really cool and really unique. So I'm just really glad that I'm getting to share that with everyone. Awesome, thank you. So someone did ask if it was going to be um, recorded or available later. So I did just put that link into the chat box for everyone. Um, all of our events are recorded um, and they will show up there in 24 to 48 hours. They have to download it and we edit them a bit before putting them back out there. Um, so Chris, is there anything you wanted to add at the end before, before I close out? Sure, thank you, Amanda. Um, I wanted to point out that Spencer's article in this issue, which he had held up as well, is available on our website, HudsonRiverValley.org. We made our back issues available while New York State's been on pause. So uh, if anybody would like to read that, it's available there. Alex's article appearing in the new issue is uh, not yet online, but it's available for purchase or subscription, which you can also do through our website. Um, and I wanted to circle back actually to the question on internships and say, well, first off, we have no power of grade over these graduates. <laughs> so thanks for the kind things you said, but stress the importance for, for viewers uh, that the internship dynamic is different than the classroom dynamic. And uh, it's something that we strive for, but I, I think it's common to all internships. It's, it's a way to help students build their networks and get some real world experience. Um, so I, I was sitting back before I didn't want to intro, but I, I think that is important to get out there. So, and thanks again to our graduates and our future intern, Alex, uh, for, for working with us on this presentation today. I, I hope it was fun for everyone. Yeah, thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us, um, for keeping Marist Alumni Association in your life. Um, again, thank you to Chris, Spencer, Alex, and Emma for joining us and sharing their expertise. Um, as I said, a full recording of this presentation will be available and we'll email you tomorrow or the next day once that's available. Um, so thanks everyone and have a wonderful afternoon or evening, I guess, depending on where you are.